Welcome back, Gators. Today we are back in beautiful Germany as we explore the tragic disappearance of pop singer Daniel Kübelböck. Daniel vanished in 2018 and was declared dead on the 10th of March this year, despite his body never being retrieved. I would like to preface today's story by letting you know that, due to the topic at hand, I will refer to Daniel using they, them pronouns. I will get more into why I chose to do that as the story progresses, but in short, I really want to be as respectful of Daniel as possible. So let's get into it. Daniel was born Daniel Dominik Kübelböck on the 27th of August 1985 in Hutturm, which is a municipality in Bavaria. Can we take a moment to appreciate Bavaria though? Stunning. In December of last year, Hutum had a population of some 6,300 people, which at 51 and 49% consisted of pretty much an equal amount of male and female residents. Hutum sits within the Passau district, which itself is separated by the river Danube, and is located very close to the Ilz Valley, a nature reserve popular both with locals and tourists. People go there to hike, cycle or just to relax and have a picnic with family and friends. More recently, the town has really been advocating for a greener planet, so yay to that. Daniel spent the early part of their childhood living with their two siblings and parents until their divorce. Before their sister came around, his parents really longed for a daughter, so Daniel took on more of a feminine role in the household, which can't have been easy on a child. After the parents' divorce, Daniel, their brother and sister, stayed with their mother Bianca on a farm where they spent the majority of their formative years. Bianca was a terrible drunk, who would go on to marry seven different men in the time Daniel lived with her, most of whom were drunks too, and they really struggled with not having a male figure in their life they could rely on. Most of these men were drunk 24-7 and couldn't have cared less about Daniel. The family would also move on 15 occasions throughout Daniel's childhood, so they were never able to bond with friends or have any kind of stability in their life. It's really sad considering they were already dealing with their parents splitting up and they were only a kid. While living with Bianca, Daniel would be subjected to both verbal and physical abuse at the hands of their mother. While under the influence, she would often lash out and shout obscenities at her young child. In their autobiography, which Daniel published at 18 in 2003, they recalled how at one point their mother came into the room and they jumped on their bed trying to escape Bianca's grip. She, however, got hold of Daniel's neck and began shaking and choking her child. Daniel said that their mother then screamed, You are not my child. You should not be my child. Naturally, Daniel was absolutely terrified and to make matters worse, their mother then told them that they will never amount to anything in life, that they're nothing and that they are completely worthless, basically. I can't imagine what it's like to hear your own mother say something like that, and Daniel did say that the way they were raised played a huge part in how insecure they were as an adult, and how unloved they felt growing up. Later in life, when questioned by the press, their mother refused to speak on how she treated her child. And if this wasn't enough, Daniel was also heavily bullied in school for having protruding ears, with kids calling them Dumbo in reference to the Disney character, who happens to be the cutest thing ever, so jokes on them. Kids are cruel, man. Despite their trying start in life, Daniel was actually an incredibly bubbly, fun person. And that is evident when seeing them appear on television. They were one of those people that completely own a room. Their father Günther, who they were very fond of, said that Daniel was a very, very kind child and a little sunshine, really. Though Daniel adored his father, Günther was actually not part of their life growing up. He'd never visit his child and according to reports, they hardly ever spoke. Some people who knew Daniel actually said that their father only got back in touch with them when they found fame, pretending to be so proud of his child. A friend of Daniel said that they didn't have a typical father and son relationship. He actually said there was nothing normal about it and that Günther wouldn't even visit his child for Christmas. Günther, however, has rejected these claims and says that the two were always close. I suppose only Daniel knows the truth. As a child, 
Daniel was super fond of acting and singing, and basically just loved to entertain people, making them laugh and have a good time. A friend of Daniel's actually said that whenever there was a birthday party, Daniel would always be the funniest person in attendance, and they would just walk around entertaining guests. Having been born with such a love for everything entertainment, and paired with such an outgoing personality, Daniel often took part in school plays and performed on smaller local stages. And when they turned 13, they signed up for dancing classes in Passau. After graduating from secondary school aged 16 in September 2001, Daniel began an internship as a pediatric nurse in a kindergarten in Eckenfelden, and they really enjoyed it. They just loved helping people, and again it gave them an opportunity to put a smile on people's faces. Around that time, they also moved in with their dad, which was a much healthier living environment than living with their mother, and their life finally took a turn for the better. At the end of 2002, Daniel then decided to temporarily hold their internship to audition for Deutschland sucht den Superstar, a brand new singing competition launched that year that is sort of the equivalent of American Idol. At their audition, they impressed the judges with their quirky personality, having brought along a guitar which wasn't technically allowed, and they made it through to the live stages. As the show progressed, Daniel quickly won the hearts of the audience and definitely stood out among the competition, gaining far more popularity than the other candidates and not just for their singing. There was just something about them that drew people in. For example, Daniel was featured in the German newspaper Bild and given far more coverage than his fellow candidates, and everyone began to think that they would win the show. And the audience had every reason to think that. Out of nine live rounds, they gained most viewer votes in three of them, and the second most votes in three further rounds, eventually finishing the competition in third place. But because Daniel was so popular, their exit from Deutschland sucht den Superstar didn't mean the end of their career. They instead went on to record the first of many singles to come, called You Drive Me Crazy, which made it to the top of the charts in 2003. It's one of those songs that gets stuck in your head even though you can't stand it, so if you look it up, you've been warned. The single was followed by an album release, Positive Energie, which went to earn them around 1 million euros in proceeds. But unlike many people who get to enjoy newfound fame, they didn't just waste all that money on cars and clothes, but actually invested it in a solar plant in Lower Bavaria, which brought them super high profits. That year, they also launched a perfume line with three fragrances for boys and girls, and in 2004 made their movie debut in Daniel de Zaubera. Unfortunately, the film was a complete flop and critics consider it one of the worst movies of all time. Clearly, they haven't watched a Serbian film. Also in 2004, they starred in Germany's equivalent of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, where they finished in third place. Throughout all of their TV appearances and sales, Daniel would always invest the proceeds in really prosperous ventures, so purely financially speaking, they were very well off. From 2007, they then switched from pop music to country music and hosted a charity event for the AIDS Foundation, something they really cared about. Then, in 2011, Daniel met 70-year-old Kerstin Elisabeth Kaiser in Mallorca, where he now lived. Kerstin, whose mother had been a fan of Daniel's, was a millionaire property entrepreneur who had no children and lived a single, relatively lonely life. When the two met, they got along so well. Daniel, given the rough childhood, early success and understanding of the business world, was mature beyond their age, so the two had a lot to talk about. Kerstin was someone who offered them stability, and she was a mother figure to an individual who prior to meeting her never felt that sort of connection with a woman. Daniel said the two were super close, describing them as soulmates. They said that Kerstin touched her heart, and though many people say one can't choose one's family, they did just that, which is both cute and accurate. Your family is whoever has your back, guys. Eventually, in 2016, Kerstin offered to formally adopt Daniel, and they agreed. Following the adoption, they then went by the name Kaiser Kübelböck. Daniel's parents, meanwhile, thought that this step was a bit strange, but they didn't really mind given that they were an adult and capable of making sensible choices. 
Around the time Daniel met Kerstin, they also came out as homosexual, having previously identified as bisexual. So Daniel was really coming into their own. They were financially set, lived in a country they loved, had many plans for their future, and finally had a mother they could be proud of. But in 2013, tragedy would strike when Daniel's brother Michael, who had a young daughter, was found dead of an overdose in his apartment. Though Daniel was not close to either sibling after they moved out, they had broken off all contact to Michael years prior to his untimely death. You see, in addition to being a drug addict, Michael was also rumored to be a neo-N. I can't say the word due to monetization issues, but let's say he was very right-wing in a very radical manner, and Daniel wouldn't support that. I mean, their last album was called Jesus is my lover for Christ's sake. In 2014, Daniel then made another comeback with the single Be A Man, with which they attempted to change their image and show off a mature side. Daniel said that the song is about the story of a young man who is too shy to find a girl in this world. He finally decides to leave his dreary existence behind and change everything in his life, which I found very interesting considering where the story is headed. With this song, Daniel actually wanted to represent Germany at the Eurovision Song Contest in Denmark, but they were rejected. When the single was released, they were in a long-term relationship with a man called Robin Gasse, so perhaps the song being about a woman was more intended to appeal to a Eurovision audience, which is very sad really. In 2015, they then joined Let's Dance, a German version of Dancing with the Stars where they partnered up with South African dancer Oti Mabuse and finished in 6th place. Then finally, also that year, they decided that it was high time they began pursuing their one true passion, acting. That same year, they began an internship at the Europäisches Theaterinstitut Berlin. And while everything went smoothly in the beginning, things would eventually take a turn for the worse. In the summer of 2018, the last year of their internship, people came across a Facebook post presumably written by Daniel accusing the school of mobbing. In the post, which was published on their Facebook fan site, 33-year-old Daniel discussed how their latest role, in which they portrayed a transvestite, basically made their co-students make fun of them. They said that the mobbing went on for months and that it hurt them to their core to be subjected to it on the daily. The head of the school, Robert Mao, however denied all these allegations. He said that nobody knows whether this post was actually written by Daniel, and that even if that were the case, he reckons that it must be just one big misunderstanding. Robert said that to him, Daniel came across as aggressive and unreliable. They would apparently often come to school drunk, and the principal advised Daniel to seek therapy, but they refused. Around this time, Reports began circling the web, alleging that Daniel suffered from various psychological issues, something his family would also back up. The principal also told the press that the last time he heard from his student was at the end of August, which was after Daniel had made that post. He said that they told him how the role of Aurora, the transvestite they played, made them realize just how much they identified with the female sex and that they wanted to become a woman. They also told Robert that yes, it would be a painful path, but that they were happy. One week later, on September the 2nd, 2018, Daniel then set up a second Instagram account, clearly stating that they identify as transsexual. They also used the female words for both artist and actress. However, though this appears to be their account, I mean the pictures sort of prove it. They never confirmed this in any official capacity, which is the main reason I refrained from using she, her pronouns. His family, friends, ex-partners, teachers, and the media use he, him pronouns to this day. A month prior to that, Daniel decided to embark on a cruise to New York, which was to set sail from a port in Hamburg. It was a journey they had planned for a long time and they were really excited about it. And according to a friend, Elke Schumann, there was a very important reason behind said excitement. Elke, who works as a manager, described how one or two weeks prior to their trip, 
They called her up and they were pretty much beaming with joy. She said that Daniel told her that as soon as they get back from their cruise, they plan to undergo gender reassignment surgery and live fully as a woman. At that point, they had already been taking a considerable amount of hormones because they wanted to transition so much and Elke said that the hormones really affected their personality. She actually said that Daniel's personality changed completely due to the hormone intake. Daniel had also had a hair transplant procedure in Turkey around this time and they planned to have a liposuction done in Saarland upon their return. Their father, however, thought that the change in their personality might be connected to something completely different. Their father said that a few years prior to the cruise, Daniel got involved in an argument in Mallorca. Apparently, during that disagreement, they were struck over the head and ended up having a fractured skull. Günther said that the surgery went really well, but that Daniel was never quite the same after that. They would often call their father at night and speak gibberish. At first, Günther thought that they might have been drunk as they sounded so confused, but shortly after those episodes, they'd go back to their usual self. On August 29, 2018, Daniel got on board the Ida Luna and should have arrived in New York after a 17-day journey on September the 15th. Daniel was one of 2,050 passengers. Once on board, they introduced themselves to the other passengers as Lana and only wore female clothes. One passenger said that Daniel was often seen wearing white tights and a short skirt. But that isn't all passengers observed. Sebastian Kuna and his mother Evelyn were two passengers sharing a cabin that was adjacent to the one Daniel was staying in. Their rooms were separated by a connecting door, so they could hear whatever was going on in each other's rooms very well. Now Sebastian said that he didn't recognize Daniel when they first met on their balconies, which makes sense their appearance was, after all, female, and everyone knew them as male. Sebastian said that pretty much as soon as the ship left, Daniel began to behave very strangely. He explained to media how Daniel told the pair their name was Lana, and that they seemed to really want to be perceived as a woman, as was reflected in their clothes and demeanor. A little while later, Daniel bumped into mother and son again, and when they saw Evelyn, they greeted her with Hi, Mom. Sebastian, who works as a life coach, said that the pair didn't really mind that, but that sometime later, what was supposed to be a quiet, relaxing trip for mother and son, turned into a screaming nightmare. He said that on September the 4th, Daniel would sing in his cabin, utter high-pitched screams, and talk to themselves in both a male and a female voice. And if that wasn't enough, they then began throwing stuff around inside their own cabin, screaming some more, and kicking against the connecting door. Naturally, Sebastian and his mother started to worry, and they notified the crew. But it took them 20 minutes to show up. The level of professionalism, geez. Sebastian then told the managers, and I quote, this man has serious psychological problems and extreme mood swings. It doesn't look good. He's depressed. Because of my job, I am familiar with personality structures. But the Ida crew was completely overwhelmed with the situation, with a senior crew member even saying that Daniel is a celebrity and one of their best paying customers as they'd spend so much on alcohol. So as always, greed is everything and the human race sucks. Now that we've established that, back to Sebastian, who said that the last time he saw Daniel was on September the 7th, three days after his outburst in the cabin. He said that when he saw them, their eyes were glassy and they were so confused, completely disoriented. However, despite being visibly shaken, they apologized to Sebastian and told him that they're not feeling well. They then also confided in the passenger and said that they really want a sex change. Sebastian said that the whole conversation was a huge cry for acceptance. Then, in the early morning of September the 9th, as the Ida Luna crossed Newfoundland, Daniel disappears. At this point, the cruise ship was about to go ashore in St. John, Canada, but the staff went to check on passengers to see if everyone could be accounted for, and Daniel was gone. When they noticed Daniel was not in their room, they conducted a thorough search of the whole ship, 
but they were nowhere to be found. The staff then informed the captain, who decided to quickly turn around, in hopes of finding Daniel in the water somewhere. The water temperature at the time was around 10 degrees Celsius. At around 6 a.m., the crew also sent out an emergency call to the Canadian Rescue Center in Halifax, and the Canadian Coast Guard then launched a search with two ships, a surveillance aircraft and a helicopter. In the meantime, Canadian police was investigating the surveillance footage, which apparently showed an individual, who they presumed was Daniel, climbing the railing at around 4 a.m. The individual is then seen jumping into the ocean intentionally. It wasn't a fall, nor did they slip. They were allegedly doing an intentional jump. A spokesperson from Ida then also came forward to say that it is their assumption that it was Daniel and that they did jump. The search team looked for Daniel for 24 hours, both in the water and on the ship, but without any success. The next day, on September the 10th, they then decided to end their search because they figured that by now, it wasn't humanly possible for them to still be alive given the water temperature. Meanwhile, Daniel was declared as missing by Interpol. On September the 11th, Daniel's family put out a statement on their official website saying that they're hoping for a miracle. According to the Disappearance Act, Daniel could have been declared dead six months after their disappearance, so in March 2019, but their family weren't ready to take that step. The press later revealed that Daniel didn't actually go on a solo trip to New York, but that he had boarded a cruise ship with Kestin, whom he affectionately called Omi, which means grandma. Now you may wonder, well, wouldn't Kerstin know what happened? Well, shortly after the ship's return to the shore, Daniel's ex-boyfriend Robin came forward to say that Kerstin, too, had vanished. Robin said that he had tried desperately to get through to Kerstin, as he was badly affected by Daniel's disappearance, and he hoped that talking to her would help him deal with his grief. Maybe she could tell him what Daniel was up to in his last days, how he felt, stuff like that. Robin said that he always texted her and that in the past the two actually talked frequently and ignoring him wasn't something she did. Robin actually said Kerstin never picked up her phone, not once, and every time he'd message her on WhatsApp, the messages would go undelivered. And he has his own theory for why this is the case. He thinks that Kerstin took off with Daniel on purpose, that the two of them basically planned this whole thing and are now living somewhere in Canada where it is easier for Daniel to live as a woman, as nobody knows him there. And I mean, I can see why he'd think that. They were both loaded and could have easily influenced the crew. I mean, the staff already said that Daniel was their best paying customer and completely neglected his mental state for money. So one can just imagine how far they'd go for a larger sum. Maybe they got off the ship and were now living somewhere in Newfoundland. But Günther denied this, saying that he's actually in touch with Kerstin on the regular and that she did return to Germany, but simply wants to live a quiet life away from the media. An employee of hers also went on to confirm that Kerstin just wants to be left alone. But this isn't exactly proof that she is in Germany. She could very well be texting people from a farm in Canada, just saying. Meanwhile, Elke, Daniel's friend, said she was texting them while they were on board. She asked them whether they had met anyone interesting on the cruise, you know, a la an affair to remember, and they said no, just idiots. Elke also said that her friend would have never taken their own life, as they were not 1% suicidal, but rather mentally fit, and she isn't alone in her belief. Peter, another friend, posted on Facebook that he doesn't think for a moment that Daniel intentionally jumped, but that they did always like to play with fire, Peter said at hearing of the incident, he wasn't shocked. He knew that Daniel would often go looking for danger and risk their life for a bit of fun, and that this time they simply didn't have anyone to stop them. Peter recalled how one night, Daniel climbed up onto a hotel's roof for the thrill of it and pretended to slip. Peter almost died of fear. Naturally, he thinks that Daniel died of a tragic accident probably by pretending to slip off that railing and then actually falling into the sea. He said that Daniel always drank champagne, sometimes three bottles and then some. Afterwards, they'd get difficult, loud and aggressive. 
if they felt misunderstood, they freaked out. Interestingly, Peter described how Daniel really couldn't handle any form of criticism, and that the smallest critique would immediately drive them bonkers. They were always a very emotional person, and this sort of ties in with what their teacher said of them. Last year, Daniel, as well as anyone who might have any information regarding their whereabouts, was asked to inform the court of this by the 25th of December 2020, or they would be legally declared dead. Meanwhile, fans noticed some activity on Daniel's official Instagram account. It appeared that someone was deleting some pictures and comments, but nobody would ever find out who that was. Their family didn't come forward to say it's them, and neither did any of their friends. On the 22nd February this year, the Passau District Court then declared Daniel as deceased, with the time of death determined as the 9th of September 2018 at 8.55am. Following the announcement, their father said that Daniel's family is not satisfied with the action taken by the court. Günther actually appealed against these proceedings several times and said in an interview that though he did wish to declare Daniel as deceased, he wanted to be the one to apply to do this. As it turns out, another individual applied to have Daniel pronounced dead anonymously, and Günther felt it wasn't fair as this was his child. He was also still holding on to hope and finding it hard to move on without a body, yet in the end, he accepted the court's decision. However, yet another friend, who didn't want to be named, has a different theory for why their family was so reluctant to have them declared dead. He suggested that Daniel's parents actually wanted to inherit Kerstin's fortune, which would pass on to them in the event of Daniel's death. So basically, it goes like this. If Daniel dies before their adoptive mother, their birth parents inherit only part of Daniel's fortune. But if they are officially deceased after Kerstin's death, they will inherit her fortune first, and if they are then pronounced dead, their biological parents get everything, including the inheritance of the adoptive mother. The friend reckoned that if they wanted to have Daniel declared dead so much, they could have done it six months after the incident, but they waited. Of course this might have been due to grief and it must be an absolutely heartbreaking step to take, or, well never mind. What do you guys think? Did Daniel jump and swim their way to Newfoundland? Did they hide in a cabin somewhere and escape? Did they slip and fall or were they so drunk they jumped just for the fun of it? Or did someone bully them on the ship and they decided it is too painful a path to walk and end it? The thing is, if they wanted to start a new life with Omi, why not just arrive in Canada and then disappear? I mean, they had the money. Either way, this is such a tragic story, a tragic life from start to finish, and I hope one way or another, Daniel has found her happiness in this world or the afterlife, if you believe in that sort of thing. As always, a big thank you to my gators out there. Thank you for listening, and until we meet again, ciao.